been doing the Building Thinking Classrooms framework with my students for an entire year. I shared my results in this video and today I'm going to talk about how to get started. Exactly what you need to think through to get started in your classroom, especially for the upcoming school year or anytime really. You can start anytime. The first thing you're going to want to do is think about your spaces, define your spaces. So if you're working K to two, groups of two work better and third grade and above, groups of three work better. I have done groups of three, like if I have an odd number of students that day, but they don't work as well for young students just because they're not really great. <laughs> they're not really great at having conversations and like sharing a workload between three people. Usually one man gets, one person gets left out or may not be contributing as much as if it was just two people in a partnership. And so with your groups of two, you're gonna need more spaces than others. Like for example, I had 22 students for most of the year, so I needed 11 different spaces where they could work. Kind of def well, going along with defining my, your spaces, you need to gather your materials. So dry erase markers, whiteboards, whiteboard spaces, or dry erase leaves work really, really well that you can try and mount onto the walls if you don't necessarily have the space. You can also use tabletop items, easels, lots of different things like that kind of to give students space to work that is vertical and non-permanent, preferably. One thing I will say about that is even if it's not vertical and if it's flat, which isn't ideal, one thing that's so important is to make sure that your kids are still standing up when they're doing a building thinking classrooms task. I noticed that I had one dry erase U table that was not vertical because it didn't have enough space. It worked just fine, but no matter which students were working at the U table, if they were sitting down, they were not as active participants as if they were standing up. So we took away the chairs and fixed that issue, but make sure that they are standing even if their surface itself is, non is not vertical because you didn't have the space for it. Next is to choose a randomizing method. So you could just use playing cards. I have some color-coded cards that I use that you can get at the link below for free, or you can use a computer-generated randomizer. Now, I've done both the color-coded cards and the randomizer, and especially at the beginning, the kids were not into a randomizer. They definitely thought that I was still creating the groups, even though I was not, so they preferred to pick the cards. Throughout the year, they preferred to pick the cards, but if we were running short on time or something like that, we would use the computer-generated randomizer, and it still worked, but they definitely preferred picking their own cards. So something to think about. The next thing is to pick your tasks. Now that this can be part of the, this can be the trickiest part, like what tasks do I do? And I will have for you a sample task that you can use that you can download for free, try out with your students. But one thing I will say that the book recommends and I definitely found the value in is to make sure that you're doing your non-curricular tasks first. And for me, the reason was I had different goals with non-curricular tasks. I wanted it to be fun and engaging, but I also wanted them to just get the routine of picking a partner, no matter who your partner is, not kind of throwing a fit about it, getting to the right space and getting started right away, which had nothing to do with the task. It was really just getting through the routine. Another time my task was share the marker, draw a picture together and share the marker. So draw one picture and share the marker. And again, it was just to get them used to switching on and off because I have tried doing like, you get 20, 30 seconds or a minute with the marker, you get 30 seconds with, with the marker. I just feel like it's a lot to manage and it kind of breaks up the flow that they can get into and that I can get into supporting them. So I prefer not to do that, but just have them practice really sharing the marker. I will have some links below to some places where you can get ideas for tasks in, in addition to a Facebook group that has lots of great ideas for K-2 to to teachers specifically, but there's one for K-2, to 3-5, to five. there's lots of them and they are very, very supportive and helpful places to get ideas. The next thing is to pick a schedule. Now, especially for kindergarten, I did kind of think about what balance I wanted between the thinking tasks and also things that they just needed to practice like one-to-one -one correspondence and number writing especially. So things like that kind of made the balance a little bit difficult. So what I ended up doing is I would do a thinking task once a week, like a proper thinking task once a week and sprinkle in other opportunities for kids to work in partners. And they came to prefer working in partners than working on their own, which in the grand scheme of things, I feel like is a good thing because in life, kids are gonna have to work together 
all the time, especially when you grow up, you're going to have to work with other people. So getting those skills in now is perfect. And if you're concerned about how they might do when they have to do assessments or something like that, I would say, don't worry about it. My students did amazing working, um, as amazing on their assessments, especially the problem solving portions, even though they had been working with partners the whole time when it came to it and they had to do it on their own, just the knowledge they were able to build, the concepts they were able to, um, to use and the knowledge they could pull from really supported them in any problem solving situation that they had. So I would say, don't worry about that. I really think that they'll, it'll work itself out. The next thing is to define your goals. Bring the students into what you're wanting to do. If you talk to them and say, today our goal is to make sure that we're sharing the marker, then they can know that too. So then they're practicing it. They know what they're trying to do and they can reflect on those things specifically. And having one thing to work on can be really helpful, especially with young kids. Like today we're working on this. So I'm going to make sure that I'm practicing working on this thing or that thing. You also need to think about the flow of how you want the problem solving session to run. Like if you had a perfect problem solving session, what would it look like? What would it sound like? How would students be moving around? Will they be able to move around and go to a different group to ask for help? Or do you need to direct that? There are things like if they need to go to the bathroom or if a student gets pulled for some other service, like think about what you're gonna do in that situation. So when it happens, you already know. I mean, obviously you're not gonna know everything, but some things that happen more often, you'll have an idea of what to do and you can move kids along. And reflect on what worked and what didn't. You might do some independent reflection without the kids and also some reflection with the kids. And let me tell you, the task, it's its not gonna be perfect. They are gonna have some that bomb, some that do really, really amazing, some that are just kind of in the middle. But if you're constantly thinking about how you can make it better, it's gonna work itself out. And most of the time, the kids don't even know. They don't even know if you if it worked out or not, or if it bombed or not. Because, you know, they're most of the time, they're just really go with the flow. And just like if you're seeing a performance or a live performance, unless they really, really mess up, you're not gonna know if they skipped a skip or skipped a beat or, whatever. Um, and kids are really forgiving. If you say, hey, I made a mistake with this, but you know, oh, well, we'll do better next time and move on. You're teaching them to do the same, that mistakes are not something to fear. It's something to learn from and grow from. And you'll be fine. You will be fine. I really, really think that this has been transformational for my math classroom, and I want it to be transformational for yours too. So make sure to send me a message on Instagram if you have any other questions. And again, I'm leaving the link to my problem solving uh, task that you can try, complete with like some thin slicing ideas, uh, check your understanding questions, a fun story, um, and the partner cards. Make sure that you grab those in the link below, and I will see you next time.